Welcome everyone to the Kid Lit Social. I'm Laura Backus and I'm happy to be here with you tonight. I'm really, really excited for our guest this week and we have a lot to talk about. So I'm going to get things rolling here. For those of you who are new to us, seeing us for the first time and you want to get on our list so you will hear about all of our social guests as well as other things we do, you can go to writeforkids.org forward slash ultimate dash cheat sheet and uh, fill out the little, all you're doing is giving us your email and we will then put you on our list to be notified of everything we do, but also you will get a free ebook, The Ultimate Children's Writing Cheat Sheet, which compiles our best beginner advice from 31 years of being in the children's book writing business. And if you are interested in subscribing to our newsletter, Children's Book Insider, which is celebrating its 31st anniversary this year, uh, you can go to writeforkids.org forward slash CBI and get it for $5 a month, special offer for our socialites. Um, and you will get it delivered to your inbox every month. It's about 20 pages. You will also have full access to the uh, CBI Clubhouse, which is the online membership site that comes with your newsletter with 31 years worth of information on it. <laughs> and a great perk of our newsletter is every month we either have a editor or an agent give us above the, an above the slush pile code, which means that you get a special code to submit to them and your manuscript jumps over the slush pile and gets read first, which is awesome because if those of you who have been submitting know that sometimes it can take months to hear back from an editor or agent. So this is a great way to shorten that process a bit. Um, so writeforkids.org forward slash CBI. Mm -hmm. Now we have celebrate every social I have you all send me your celebrations and I announce them and we celebrate with you. I have four good ones this week. Our friend Henry L. Herz's newest picture book. And his first creative nonfiction title, I Am Smoke, came out on September 14th with Tilbury House. Ed Kirkus gave it a starred review and called it an exquisitely beautiful melding of science and poetry. And it is. It is wonderful. And we're talking about nonfiction tonight. So this is a really great book for you all to check out. Um, and Henry will be my guest on the social on November 6th, I believe it is, the first Tuesday in November. So if you like his book, come back. And he's written, I think, nine books before this. So he could talk about lots of stuff. This is his first nonfiction. Our friend Natasha Wing was featured on Behind the Art Inspiration podcast by artist Carolyn Karp. And Natasha talks about the inspirations behind her best selling books. One of her series is called The Night Before Series, The Night Before Kindergarten, The Night Before First Grade. You might be familiar with those if you have little kids starting school. Um, and so you can watch actually the video of the podcast if you want to see Natasha herself and not just listen to her. I made a bit.ly link bit.ly forward slash Natasha Wing interview. Carmela Simmons, a CBI subscriber, writes that Anna Crespo of East West Literary Agency is joining me on this joyous journey as my literary agent. She has already proven to be just what I had hoped, knowledgeable, open, hardworking, and a true cheerleader. I couldn't be happier. Carmela, congratulations, and I love your attitude. I think with that attitude, you'll be very successful. And I really expect you to send us the announcement of your first book contract as soon as you can. We'll be looking forward to that. And Laura Smetana, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your last name, has co-authored a picture book, Little Squiggles Lake Adventure with her son, Sterling, Hebda, based on their own lake adventures. 
and the hardcover book is now available through online retailers. So I love that adorable photograph of the two of them in the kayak. So congrats, Laura and Sterling on your first co-authored book. So send me your good news. I want you to email me to mail at writeforkids.org and put celebrate in the subject line. And I will feature your news on a future Kidlet social and no celebration is too small. Okay, I say this every week, but I mean it. If you finish your first draft, we want to hear about it. If you found a critique group, we want to hear about it. If you got a great idea that you're so excited about, and it's been six months since you've had a great idea, and now you can finally start writing again, I want to hear about it. We will celebrate all of those accomplishments with you. So a couple cool links of interest this week. Uh, there are two up to upcoming Twitter pitch parties and they're coming up in soon. So I wanted to alert you to them. One is tomorrow, uh, Kidlit GN, which is for unagented middle grade or younger graphic novel manuscripts. So you could go to this website, kidlitgn.com for info. Um, obviously you need to write a, a Twitter pitch tonight uh if you want to join in, in on this if you've got if you've got your graphic novel manuscript complete and polished and ready to submit um otherwise i would hold off you don't want to pitch something too soon on october 28th is pb pitch for unagented picture book authors or author illustrators and you could go to pbpitch.com get a little more time there to polish up your manuscript and your pitch if you go to writeforkids.org, that's our sort of main website, there's a tab at the top that says Kidlit Social Replays, and go listen to the replay of Kidlit Social number 17. And that's all about Twitter pitch parties and writing a good Twitter pitch if you want some tips on that. So good luck if you uh, join this. Our, our, our guest from two weeks ago, Nadia Solomon, she talked about finding her agent on a Twitter pitch party. So it happens all the time. Okay. And now my guest, Melissa Stewart has written more than 180 science books for children. And she co-wrote Five Kinds of Nonfiction, Enriching Reading and Writing Instruction with Children's Books and edited the anthology Nonfiction Writers Dig Deep, 50 award-winning authors share the secret of engaging writing, which by the way, is an awesome anthology. And if you want to write nonfiction, you definitely have to check that out. Um, and she also maintains the award-winning blog, Infolicious Inspiration. And we have a link right there on the uh, screen. And these are her six most recent books of the 180 that she has, uh, written. So she also offers live and virtual school visits, uh, visit programs, as well as programs for educators that focus on nonfiction writing techniques and using children's books to address curriculum standards and creative ways to integrate science and language arts. So Mo Melissa, why don't you come on camera with me? One of the things I love about what Melissa does is she uh, really is tuned into helping the teachers uh, as well as the writers uh, connect with kids and with readers. And, and Melissa, I just love that about you and about your sort of mission here. Um, and part of that is kind of what we're going to be talking about tonight. But, but welcome to the Kid Lit Social, first of all. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Great. Well, normally at this time, if you've been to some of these before, I stopped sharing my screen, but we have a bunch of slides that Melissa wanted to share with you tonight. So I'm going to keep sharing for a while here. So what we're going to focus on first is this five kinds of nonfiction. And Melissa, this is kind of a mission for you. You've been talking about this quite a bit. In fact, the first time I heard of this, didn't you do a free webinar? I think it was for School Library Journal, or was that what it was? Yeah, I did a, a webinar for them about a year ago. It was sponsored by Learner. Right. And I actually been speaking even before that I was speaking at a, about it at conferences for educators and librarians, mm -hmm. really ever since I developed this, the 
system in 2017. So right. for me, it feels like a long journey, even though mm -hmm. the book is only just come out recently. Yeah, it is a long journey. And just to a real quick before we get into the actual slides, was this something that you kind of stumbled on through your own trying to categorize nonfiction? Or did you go out to really study the market and figure out how to categorize the different books? Uh, I think the answer to both of those is yes. So I, I actually, it came out of my own personal frustration back around 2012. Try, I was at, at that time, I was having a real rut in terms of trying to get manuscripts accepted by publishers. And I said, you know, I really just need to kind of analyze the market and understand what's going on. I knew that I wasn't really a narrative nonfiction writer, and that was one of the things that was hot at the time. But I said, but I know there's other books out there. And what are there ways that you can group them collectively and think about them? And are there ways, once I understand that, can I take topics that I'm passionate about and figure out how to fit them into one of these other categories so that it's most likely to be accepted? That's sort of what, what fueled it. And then over time, I, I had conversations with many people, other authors, with um, educators. And over time, I developed these different categories, sort of just plucking them from places. One category came from an editor that I met. One came from the bookstore community. Uh, one, uh, an educator that I know sort of Develop, realized that there was this category based on some things that I had written and he came up with the with the name expository literature. So I sort of am just bringing together all this collective thinking from a lot of different right. really smart minds. Mm -hmm. Well, let's get started here because I just, I love this. My, first of all, I love categorization. That's the way my mind <laughs> works. It helps me understand things much better. But I think once you see these categories, then you suddenly see, even from a writing perspective, how to go about approaching your topic in the different ways. And I imagine that also helps guide your research and the way you outline the material and just everything else. So this is a really important thing for writers to understand. So why don't you go ahead and tell us about this, first of all. Yeah, so I think the very first thing to understand about nonfiction is that there are two major writing styles, and mm -hmm. we hear a lot about narrative nonfiction. Those are books that tell a story or convey an experience, mm -hmm. but there's a whole different other category called expository nonfiction, and these are books that explain, describe, or inform in a more straightforward way. So where the Venn diagram comes together, what they both have in common is that they are meticulously researched and 100% faithful to the facts, but the way the information is presented is, is different. Mm -hmm. And then once you understand that, you can sort of go on to the five kinds of nonfiction. And if you go to the next slide. Sorry, this is a little here, blurry. This yeah, is my it's a little fault. Blurry. Uh, <laughs> So here we have the five kinds of nonfiction, but then if you go to the next slide, what you'll see is that four out of those five kinds are expository in terms of the writing style. So we hear a lot about narrative nonfiction. There's a lot of focus, but there's actually all these other kinds of books that exist that may be the kind of books that you really wanna write. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is it fair to say that back in, say, the 60s, 70s, and maybe early 80s, when a lot of us were growing up, most of the children's nonfiction was expository? Yes. Is narrative so, nonfiction a more recent development? Yeah, so traditional nonfiction, that is the category that goes back to, you know, the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, into mm -hmm. the 90s. That's really all that there was. That was the only game in town. Mm -hmm. Narrative nonfiction started in the adult publishing world in the late 1960s, maybe early 70s, and it, it trickled down to the children's market in the, in the mid 90s. That's mm -hmm. when we started to mm -hmm. see the first. Right. And so right. Each, of these, each of these different categories came at a different point mm -hmm. in the development of children's literature, the evolution of children's literature. 
So browsable is the next category that came. That actually was a reaction to the invention of desktop publishing right. in, the, um, in the early 1990s. Mm -hmm. And then expository literature came in the early 2000s. That was really a response to No Child Left Behind and the rise of the mm -hmm. internet and looking for just more uh, creative ways to present the straightforward facts. And then active nonfiction has actually existed all along but it's really become much more popular in the last few years because of the maker movement. So now if you go into any Barnes and Noble, you will see a whole big active nonfiction sure. section. This is a real big, this mm -hmm. is a growing category mm -hmm. of the market. Yeah. Well, and what's interesting, we'll move on, but I just wanted to, I've been in publishing since 1986. So I saw the beginning of all yeah. of these. And I remember when Eyewitness Books came on the scene and it was, Oh my gosh, you know, it was amazing. And then expository literature when that started. And uh, of course the active and and what was so great is now suddenly kids who had different learning styles could have access to different kinds of books that covered the same topics, but gave them the information in different ways. And like my son had ADD in elementary school, he's actually grown out of it, but than he did and he loved the browsable books were perfect for him he loved them because he could jump in get some really high interest information jump out and not lose a thread of a narrative you know um whereas he couldn't read a novel until start to finish till he was in like fifth grade just because uh, it was hard for him to focus that long and so i think it's great that kids can have access to information in so many different ways now that's just a wonderful development. Okay, let's go. So now if, if you buy the book, Five Kinds of Nonfiction, obviously there's gonna be way more information, but I just sort of have these little cheat sheets that tell you some of the basic characteristics of each category um, and what they have to offer, how they're similar to some of the others, how, what the differences are, and um, what characteristics you can look for as you're, as you're writing, what you can try to embed into the books that you're creating, the manuscripts that you're creating. Mm -hmm. I think a question a lot of people will probably have is the difference between the expository and the traditional, because they both have an expository writing style, but can you tell us a little bit about the nuances between the two? Right, so the interesting thing is that four out of five have right. the expository writing style, but they all have ways that they are different from each other. But I agree with you that expository literature is the one that people often have a little bit of trouble wrapping their heads around. Um, so traditional nonfiction, it's a survey book. It's those books that you see in series and there, some people call them all about books. So it's a book, you know, all about coral reefs, all about kangaroos, everything you wanted to know. So it's a very broad introduction mm -hmm. and expository literature is the exact opposite. It's a narrowly focused topic. And because you're zooming in on something, it gives you the ability to present that information more creatively to use a strong voice and rich language. When you're saying, you know, when you're looking at a broad category, when you're saying some fish do that, other fish do this, you know, it's hard to have that rich engaging language mm -hmm. because you're using words like some and many, and you are right. kind of trapped into having to use a lot of to be verbs, a lot of weaker verbs. Um, so that's what's so exciting about expository literature. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. And we're going to see some examples of that from your books in a few minutes to really uh, bring that point home. And then, of course, narrative nonfiction actually has it tells a story or it's it's got a beginning, middle and end. There's a narrative thread that goes through the whole uh, the whole book. Right. Right. And so there's a real character. There's mm -hmm. scenes. And, but then there's also some of the same characteristics of expository literature. There's a strong voice, there's rich engaging language. And then mm -hmm. the other key difference is the, um, the text structure. So mm -hmm. narrative nonfiction has a chronological sequence structure, 
because it, like you said, it has the beginning, middle, end. It goes chronologically through time. And traditional nonfiction generally has a description text structure where there's a system of headings and subheadings. Right. But expository literature can have pretty much any um, structure that you can think of. So mm -hmm. that's another way that it's really creative. Right, right. Okay, great. Okay, and then we have the last two here. Yeah, so browsable is is the thing, the main thing about that is that it's just lavishly illustrated with lots of photos or lots of illustrations. And these are books that I, I'm really seeing a resurgence in these right now. And I'm seeing a lot of trade publishers starting to publish them which is a new development. So how we got to the moon, that, that's a kind of, to me, that's a groundbreaking book because yeah. it's a heavily illustrated, very intricate book published by a trade publisher. It received four starred reviews and it was a cyber honor winner. And that it's for a browsable book to receive that, those kinds of accolades is astonishing. I think it's, it's showing just a new wave in how people think about browsable nonfiction, which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That is wonderful. Yeah. And then, you know, the act of nonfiction, of course, is very hands on, engaging, yeah. again, great for kids who have different methods of learning, you know, um, and can actually be paired with some of these other books to give a, a, a complete learning experience. So that's- Yeah, great. yeah, and they're great for learning a skill or mm -hmm. um, you mm -hmm. know, engaging in an activity. So that's something that they offer that the other books don't. Right, right. And just a note there on the screen, those of you who are our Children's Book Insider subscribers, if you buy the annual subscription, you have access to our back issues. And if you missed it, Melissa, we interviewed her this past June on the five kinds of nonfiction. So she goes into a little more detail there. So you could check that out. Okay. And then I love this that you share with us tonight, this chart. Yeah, so this is a chart that appears in five kinds of nonfiction and it says student purpose, but you could just cross out the word student and replace it with writer because it, it is 100% true for writers as much as it is for students, for anyone to know how to address certain kinds of topics, how to look, make use of certain kinds of texts. It's really broken down in this, um, in this chart. And there's also another chart that I love in this book that breaks down the kinds of nonfiction by craft moves. So the elements of nonfiction writing craft and oh, that wow. one is also really helpful for writers. The other mm -hmm. thing that's really wonderful um, in this book is that there are three chapters in the middle that have a lot of exercises for helping people to develop different craft elements. So if you feel like you would like to do some exercises to try to improve, improve your voice or to um, help you choose rich language or to think about text structures in different ways or text features or um, other kinds of patterns in nonfiction text. You have access to, to information. You can just read a narrative about them, but then you can also practice reading, using children's books as mentor texts and then creating pieces of writing that have these elements. So that's another real benefit for writers mm -hmm. of five kinds mm -hmm. of nonfiction. Absolutely. This is great. Uh, I can't remember what the next slide is. Oh, this is your book. Okay, before we get to your books, I wanted to ask you a couple questions. So I'm going to go back to where we actually see the five kinds here. So um, first of all, all of these books have potential for classroom use, all of these types of nonfiction, correct? Yes. Yep. And when you are writing nonfiction, now you you write expository. That's your main type of, would you say I've, that's? Yeah, I've written all five kinds. Mm -hmm. I think I'm best known for my expository literature right. books. Mm -hmm. um, but I actually, I like the variety of writing a lot of different kinds of things and for mm -hmm. a lot of different age levels. So I, I bounce around a lot. Mm -hmm. um, 
I think some people bounce around a lot in terms of topics. I always write about science, but I like to write about it in a lot of different ways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When you think of a topic and start working on your book, do you think of it in terms of how will this be used in the classroom or do you just write the book and not worry about it? I, you know, I, that's always in my mind because it mm -hmm. helps me to make decisions. So let's say there's a topic that I'm really excited about. One of the first things I'll ask myself is what grade level would this be taught at in the curriculum? And if it's elementary, then I'm going to write a book for elementary. If it's middle grade, then I'm going to write a book for middle grade because you want, you know, your book is going to sell better mm -hmm. if it can be used in the curriculum and hopefully it can be used in the curriculum in multiple ways. So hopefully it can be used by the, the subject area. Is it science? Is it history? Is it math related? Um, but then also you hope that it might be used as a mentor text in when they're teaching informational writing or nonfiction writing. And so if you can hit on some of the things that they're learning about in, in their language arts or English as you get older, mm -hmm. um, into the older grade levels, that is, it's just gonna make your book one of those, you know, there's some books like Giant Squid is my favorite example. Right. You can use that book in so many ways. I would, I, you know, if teachers say to me, what is one book that I should have, I say giant squid because it's just so you can use it in ELA, you can use it in science. It's a great read aloud. You can just, it, it's astonishing how many ways you can use that book. And mm -hmm. I think that that's really, that that's the ideal scenario. If you have a book that really can be used in all those ways, mm -hmm. it's gonna make it, um, it, you know, kids are gonna enjoy it and teachers are going to find it useful and librarians. So mm -hmm. then it will be more marketable. Right, right. Um, yeah, Giant Squid by Candace Fleming, for those of you who, who aren't familiar with it, is an extraordinary book on many levels. Um, absolutely. Um, I had another question for you. Oh, yes. When do, does the topic, does your idea dictate what kind of nonfiction it's going to end up being? Does your research kind of point you in the right direction? How do you make that decision? So really it's the approach. Mm -hmm. um, so if I want to, if I decide I want to give a broad overview of the topic, then I would write traditional nonfiction. If I wanted to focus in on something very specific and maybe write a list book, then I would go for expository literature. Um, if I wanted to tell a story, I would go for narrative nonfiction. And so I, I'm really thinking about how do I want to approach this topic? Mm -hmm. Because there's a hundred ways to approach every topic, but you want to do something fresh and interesting and challenging and something that kids are really going to connect to. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just thinking about all of those things as I'm making some of those early decisions. Mm -hmm. And does it uh, guide your research, knowing what kind of nonfiction you're going to be writing? Or is the research the same regardless? Um, I think that if I know how I'm going to do it, I, it might help me to narrow my research. So for example, if you're writing traditional nonfiction, you have to do very broad um, kinds of nonfiction uh, research. Generally, I would start doing broad research. I would kind of read around my topic, but then I would eventually focus in. Mm -hmm. And so that it, it will help me. And, and if, let's say if, if someone is writing narrative nonfiction, then they're gonna be looking for scenes. They're gonna be looking for uh, things like journals that the person has written or newspaper articles where the person is quoted um, they're going to be looking for sensory details that, that can help to bring that scene to life. Um, whereas if you're writing expository literature, you're really going to be focusing, instead of focusing on people and events, you're going to be focusing more on a, on a topic or on a very specific concept. Mm -hmm. And so it's, you just would be looking for different, different kinds of things as you're doing research. Okay, great. Thank you. It's fascinating. I love I love hearing about authors' processes. So, 
Okay, let's go look at a couple of your books here. So this is 14 Monkeys, a rainforest rhyme. Now, one of the things that I love about your books, especially your expository um, picture books, is that there are layers to the information. And so if you have, say, a four-year-old, you can read them the rhyming couplet here and they can look at the amazing illustrations by Steve Jenkins and that might be enough for them but if you've got an older child they can there there are there's more information on the page and uh what he did and I don't know if this was his idea or yours I love this tree here that pinpoints where in the rainforest each monkey lives because your point is that all these monkeys can coexist because they don't all live in exactly the same spot right they're sort of layered in the rainforest as well yeah those those were sort of the solution to a problem that we encountered so he, he when he does his um cut paper or torn paper mm -hmm. art there's a lot of white space on the page mm -hmm. um, so that the images really pop and so that that paper, the, the shapes of the paper become recognizable as the objects that they, or backdrops or whatever that they are meant to be. Mm -hmm. And so what that meant is that it made it kind of hard to show at what height they lived above the forest floor. And I really, I wanted the art to show that, um, but then as I had conversations with, with the um, editor and the art director and with him, we realized that that wasn't going to be possible and but then he came up with this amazing little infographic idea yep. so that it's actually mimicking the art piece from the end of the book which you've shown a part of there in the mm -hmm. upper right hand right. corner and mm -hmm. um and it shows where each of the monkeys live which is a it's a really important part of their life where they mm -hmm. live determines what they eat mm -hmm. um and what kind of predators they encounter. So I, I love that he came up with that solution. Mm -hmm. It's great. And as you can see, those of you who, who are reading the slide here, you know, there is a lot of creativity in the language in uh, the way, Melissa, that you conveyed this information, even though it's expository. So with expository what kind of creative license can you take in the in the telling or or does it do you have to be very careful that everything that you write is documentable as you said but but you're just playing with the language with the sentence structure with the the rhyme for example right that it, that it's just looking at those creative elements so for mm -hmm. example the fact that i chose layer text that is a creative decision mm -hmm. um the fact that the text structure so this book actually has a dual text structure it has a compare and contrast text structure because you're comparing the 14 different monkeys mm -hmm. but it also layered on top of that is a chronological struct sequence structure because it's going from day to night so that you're showing the first page here, which is the howler monkey, which is starting off in the morning. But the, we see the monkeys through the course of the day and on the last mm -hmm. few spreads, right. it's at night. Mm -hmm. And so going from day to night and having a, a natural cycle gives the make gives it it's it's just it's innately satisfying. And so mm -hmm. the reader may not even consciously identify that. Mm -hmm. But it affects the way that they, they it feels satisfying, feels like a satisfying ending to them because it's a rhythm that they're used to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's great. And then, you know, you had mentioned before that expository nonfiction zeroes in on a narrow focus of the bigger topic. So here, instead of talking about the whole rainforest, which might've been a traditional nonfiction type of book, you are zeroing in on these 14 monkeys and exactly where they live in relation to each other. Um, yes, yeah, so what this book is actually, so the mm -hmm. focus of this mm -hmm. book is a concept, the mm -hmm. concept of the ecological niche. Okay. And so that's what's explored in this book through the monkeys. Mm -hmm. So it's showing that an astonishing, so that no, uh, 14 monkeys is the most monkeys that live in any rainforest anywhere in the world, at mm -hmm. least that we know of. 
And so how is it possible for so many monkeys to survive together in one place? And it's that they have very specific um, sizes. Um, they live at different heights above the, the forest floor. They uh, eat different foods. And so that is the solution to how right. the question, how can they all live together? So how, what are the ecological niches of all of these animals that allow them to live together in harmony? And that's the, the idea, that's the big idea that I really wanted to explore. And the monkeys are, the, and this rainforest are the conduit. So this book is not about rainforests. No. It's just kind of coincidental that it's a rainforest. It could have been, you know, I could have looked at lizards in a desert or something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. um, but I chose rainforests because um, rainforests are part of the curriculum mm -hmm. and rainforests are really fascinating places. I've been to the rainforest and I chose monkeys because who doesn't like monkeys? So mm -hmm. I thought right. it would be a really compelling group of creatures in a really compelling environment. Um, but it was, it also allowed me to look in detail at this ecological niche concept, which is something that's part of the science curriculum um, but it allows me to look at it in a way that also has a strong language arts component because you can use it as part of a poetry unit. You can also use it in your informational writing unit to look at how to craft um, informational writing, which is a very important part of, mm -hmm. of the mm -hmm. curriculum. So it's, it, right. it has you know rich language, strong verbs, um, all that kind of thing. I can see this used as you were talking about the big idea here in even in like middle school sociology classes, if they're talking about human societies and how different people live together in a crowded environment, for example, or, you know, an intro to city planning, you know, and then you have this book as an example of how all these different monkeys can live in the same environment because they're not eating the same food. They're not living on exactly the same level of the forest. I, I could see the parallels being drawn in a really interesting way that would introduce kids to this idea in other situations as well. So you could you could extrapolate that out um, to all kinds of lessons. Yeah, I think. and you could you could also even use this in a social emotional learning kind of lesson because cooperation is so important. On some mm -hmm. spreads, there are two monkeys that are related. They're part of the same broader group. But for example, one of them lives higher up and one of them lives closer to the ground. And they actually, um, they share the same predators. So one of the ones that are up high, they look, you know, they warn everyone about hawks and the, uh, you know, some of the birds of prey. And the ones that live lower, they're on the lookout for let's say wild cats. Huh. And so those two groups of monkeys work together. And although I don't cover it in the book, there's actually even larger groups of monkeys, interspecies um, relationships of them helping one another, which mm -hmm. goes beyond the scope of this book, but it's totally fascinating. Wow. Wow. I think you need to write a sequel. <laughs> <laughs> it is fascinating. Okay. And here's another fascinating one that I love is your summertime sleepers. And again, uh, and by the way, the little arrows on each side of this graphic, it's just because I had the ebook and I was taking pictures of it. So in the hardcover, you don't have the arrows. Um, but again, lots of different layers here that depending on the age of the child, their interest level, that you can still get great information. And tell us a little bit about this book here. Yeah, so this book also has, it actually has even an additional layer of information um, because Sarah Brannon, the illustrator, came up with the idea of including these notebook pages. I have worked on three books with her and she is a big nature journaler. Mm -hmm. And so she always likes to try to get drawing and encouraging people to draw and to look at nature through mm -hmm. drawing. That's, that's something that's very close to her heart. And so we always look for ways when we're collaborating to include that kind of idea in the book, which I think is wonderful. And it also having these additional illustrations, she, she's like, 
well, this is great because you can put in more information and I know you're yes. going to like that because now I can have the scientific name. I can have the size of it. We can show the actual size of it. We can look at it up close. We can give an example of where it lives. So there's a lot of information mm -hmm. just in that piece, but yep. then there's also the main text. And so again, this is a dual layer um, mm -hmm. structure because it's also compare and contrast. You're comparing these different animals that estivate or sleep through the winter but there's also an opposites text structure. So some, it says some insects, oh, there you go. That's yeah, great. So it's two, like I some insects <laughs> do this, but then others do this other totally different thing. Mm -hmm. And so it goes back and forth and back and forth. And so that even though the reader might not consciously realize that it has, again, it ha it's innately pleasing to your mind because of how our minds are structured to think. And so I always am trying to play off on, because there's no story, even people who tend to love stories, if there's this way of connecting and, and a flow through the book, then it still can be satisfying even to a person who is a real narrative lover. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And what I, I have the, uh, some of the back matter here, the other sort of pattern you have here is you have we go all the way from insects to mammals, but you have two insects, two, what did you call them? Hard shelled creatures, mm -hmm. um, two fish, two amphibians. I mean, you kind of go up the scale, but there's two of each said you compare and contrast. Uh, so there's sort of the opposites within each of those pairs. Um, and they all yeah. estivate. So it's and just then, right. And then, and then the other interesting thing that you can see from this is that this another way of structuring the, the book, there's a, a an even another hidden layer of the way the book is, stru is structured because it goes from the smallest animal mm -hmm. to the largest animal, the largest. but mm -hmm. it also goes in evolutionary order. Oh. So all these patterns are embedded and not every reader is going to notice them, but you know what? There will always be some kid who will come to this realization on their own and they will be so excited to tell me. It's like, they don't, they think I don't know it's in my own book. <laughs> you know, they're like, do you know they are in size order? And I, yeah. and I, you know, uh, it just thrills me when they come to that on their own and they're just so excited that they can see this and they can see the work that is behind what could seem like a fairly simple book. Yes. And so, putting all those layers in, it must take a lot of starts and stops in the writing process. In the back matter of this book, you did have an author's note about kind of your process to develop this book. But I know you talk about those sorts of things a lot. Actually, I want to show people this next page. So this is from your website. You have one of the things I love about Melissa's website is she has all these wonderful videos uh, and it actually goes much farther than this. This is a partial screenshot where you talk a lot about your process, how you came up with ideas, how you, the, the many uh, uh, efforts it took to find the right structure for a book. And they're mainly used, you make them for classroom use, but I was telling you earlier that I find, I watch them and I learn so much about the writing process from them. So I encourage everybody to go look at them, but um how much of your process is that sort of trial and error and and working around in circles until finally you hit on the right way to write about a topic yeah that so finding the structure is always a challenge um but but for me that's also the fun of it it's it's a, mm -hmm. it's a fun challenge it's like putting together a puzzle um and it it can take years you know the mm -hmm. The Summertime Sleepers, that book was 11 years from inspiration to publication. And I just want to give a shout out. There is a fantastic blog called First Draft to Final Book um, by Shay Fan. Mm -hmm. And I did a blog post there for Summertime Sleepers. And what she has people do is to create a timeline of all the different steps in the process. It's, it's a, an amazing resource. I would urge everyone to go and take a look at it because it really helps you um, 
it kind of lays bare the creative process in a way that I think is very useful for, for writers. But I, as you're saying, I, I agree with you. I think that all of these, even though they're created for teachers and for the classroom, they're 100% useful to writers as well. Mm -hmm. And um, so some of them are videos, some of them are more um, kind of interactive slideshows with um, embedded audio components um, to sort of take you along on the journey so they can be accessed in a lot of different ways. Um, but I, I think it is really helpful for writers to know that it takes many, even though these books seem short and simple, it, it takes many, many years and don't feel frustrated mm -hmm. if it doesn't all just come to you right away that, that, you know, I'll try something and it fails, I'll try something and it fails. And, mm -hmm. um, it's just part of the process. And there's, there's actually, I saw when people were signing in, there's someone here from my critique group and she knows how, just how much, how many times I read it in the critique group and they give me great feedback. And then I go back and I make changes. There are just so many people that are part of every book that I make it, you know, it takes a village. So you, you know, there's an author and you know, there's an illustrator and you know, there's an editor but there's so many other people that are also part of the book. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, and I so appreciate you being so open about the process and how long it takes in the, the, you know, you've been writing for so long and everybody assumes you just whip these things out now, but <laughs> every book is a new journey for the writer. And for you to share that is, is, is great for, for aspiring authors to see uh, that, it's it, it can be difficult for everybody, no matter how much experience you have. Every book is, like I said, is a new a new journey. Absolutely. So, yeah. So I want to get to some questions here. Thank you so much for that. That was so informative. Uh, so Pamela is asking, and again, this is uh, a good question for people who are sort of new to the writing process. How does the author of an expository nonfiction deal with illustrations if you are not an illustrator? So do you put any kind of illustration notes in your manuscript or do you trust the illustrator to handle that? I try not to include ex notes because it's so important for the illustrator to be able to bring their mm -hmm. own sensibility to it. Um, I think that, but what I do is I, especially for a book like Estivation, where there are animals from all over the world and all kinds of unusual habitats, is that I provide reference material for the illustrator. So it, it, the notes aren't actually in the manuscript, but I have a separate file that has all kinds of photos. So I say, okay, here's this animal, here's its scientific name, here's where it lives, here's pictures of where it lives. Mm -hmm. And um, so it, it, all of that is there. Now, this, the illustrator still has to go out and do tons of their own research, but it's a place for them to start. Sure. Yeah. Okay, great. And I'm sure they appreciate getting, you know, whatever research you've done ahead of time. So are, do certain publishers publish more for the educational market than other publishers? I know the answer to that, but I'm going to have you give your two cents to that question. I think no matter what, who the publisher is, schools and libraries are the number one market mm -hmm. for all nonfiction books. So there, you know, even like Simon Schuster or Penguin Random House, they have a school marketing division full of people and all they're doing is trying to get these books in front of teachers and librarians' eyes. Mm -hmm. um, and so that is a critical part. As, by the way, it's a critical part of the fiction market too. Mm -hmm. Children's literature would not exist without school and library purchases. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think it's especially important for nonfiction. And so that's why keeping teachers' needs in mind is, is so, so helpful. Absolutely. And we have three webinars on our Writing Blueprint site by Lionel Bender, who is a partner in the book packager, Bender Richards, Bender Richardson White. He does a lot of books for educational publishers, and he did a webinar for us on writing for educational publishers, as well as writing for book packagers. So 
We'll send out the link to that with the replay, but if you want to know more about that, um, a lot of them are series. So there's a certain technique to writing for an existing series that you need to be aware of. Okay. Oh, uh, do you know, again, uh, as far as the age range of biographies now, I, you know, for your books, for when you're writing expository or any other kind of nonfiction, but it's in the picture book format, uh, kind of what age do you have in mind with with what you're writing in for picture books? So I think picture books, nonfiction picture books, um, whether it's narrative nonfiction or expository literature, can there's sort of two categories. There's some that are younger for kind of K to two or maybe pre K mm -hmm. to two. And then there's some that are more grades two to five, grades three to five. Mm -hmm. um, and then above that, there's, you know, middle grade, which there's a, there's overlap because so middle sure. grade is ages nine to 12. And then above mm -hmm. that, there's there's young adult. Mm -hmm. um, so there really there isn't really an early reader kind of category for nonfiction. There, there are a few little books that fit in that niche, right. but but not like not mm -hmm. as much as in fiction right so you kind of jump from picture book to middle grade but mm -hmm. biographies i think the question was about biographies there i think that um middle grade biographies are one of the biggest um growth areas of the nonfiction market right now mm -hmm. i agree and even in the picture book biography format they do tend to skew older often than like a fiction picture book would. I think the biographies often appeal to kids up to like nine or 10 years old in picture books before we even get into sort of longer middle grade. But you're right, middle grade biographies are very, very huge right now. Especially I think there's so of, many, yeah, oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. I was <laughs> no, gonna no. say, I think there's so many ways that picture books can be used mm -hmm. in middle grade and even in high school for mm -hmm. even if you're, if you're talking about story arc in high school, reading picture books is a great way to approach that because it's a very short manageable book you can read mm -hmm. it you know in maybe seven ten minutes and then have a discussion whereas if you were going to read a novel it would take days and days mm -hmm. and so if there are certain aspects of constructing a narrative picture book can be a great way to go mm -hmm. absolutely so Lisa asks, if you provide information on a topic in the form of a narrative story, could it be considered nonfiction even if the characters are fictitious? So there is a lot of fictional elements creeping into narrative nonfiction right now. Um, for example, a book that I used as an example in a webinar I did last weekend was um, Don't Lick This Book which is all about microbes and germs, but it's got these fictitious, almost cartoon character microbes that are leading you through the book and they're, they have dialogue, but it's considered nonfiction. So- Well, those are actually informational fiction. They're informational so they're, fiction. They're, they're considered, okay. some people will call them informational books, okay. but mm -hmm. they're not nonfiction. Okay. Nonfiction has to be 100% true. Okay, informational fiction. Because what I always try to figure out is where is where do I find it in my library? And sometimes I find those shelved with the nonfiction. And so it's very confusing <laughs> as to know what exactly you call call these. So books. there's that's a very interesting point. And so the thing to know about the nonfiction section and sort of the history mm -hmm. of libraries in general is that originally when the Dewey Decimal System started all the books were put by call numbers, including fiction. But then patrons like around the early 1900s would say, oh, I just want a good story. And so they actually pulled novels and short story collections out of the general collection mm -hmm. and called that fiction. And then they left everything else behind. So if you look at the what's the nonfiction section in the library, it, it includes poetry, it includes folk tales, it includes it does, yeah. informational fiction. Okay. It includes a lot of things that don't, that aren't just a novel. It, graphic novels are actually in the nonfiction section. Now what, in, what happens in many collections 
is that the graphic novels are actually pulled out and shelved on their own because kids are so excited about graphic novels. But graphic novels actually belong, they should be housed according to the Dewey Decimal System in nonfiction. So when we talk about the nonfiction section of the library, that's sort of different about when we talk about nonfiction writing, right. which is 100% right. true. Okay, well, that is a great distinction. Thank you for that. But yeah, informational fiction is an interesting category that is, is, and that's also being used quite a bit in the classrooms, correct? So it can be a very creative way to write as well. Um, and, and, it, and it often also has back matter, I've noticed, even, um, even fiction stories that, are, that have a lot of information in them will have a substantial back matter. I think that's very important these days. I think, yeah, I think more and more books, fiction and nonfiction are including uh, back matter because teachers are just, they're so, they find it so useful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So do you think if you're querying an editor, you should say what kind of nonfiction you're writing or is that important? Will they kind of get it from, from your query in the description? I think it definitely couldn't hurt. I think it will help them to get a sense of, of where you see this fitting. Mm -hmm. I think the biggest, the biggest reason that a, a sometimes a very well-written book on a great topic will get rejected. And the reason is that the editor can't envision what the final book will be. That's the most important thing for acquisition is that they know what the book is going to be. They can picture it, um, you know, the final product that will go on the shelf. And mm -hmm. sometimes they really like the writing, they really like the topic, but they just can't imagine what that final product is gonna be. And so they end up rejecting it. So I think the more assistance that you can give them and helping them understand oh what the format is going to be. I, uh, you know, editors will often say to me, well, what's your package? And so right. what they mean by that is not, okay, we like your manuscript, but the, the main, especially for nonfiction, the manuscript mm -hmm. is just one piece of a much bigger entity. It's, mm -hmm. you know, what is the, the art going to be? What is the design going to be? What is the format going to be? Um, that those are all really critical things for nonfiction. Mm -hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, that's very, a very good point. And um, identifying a market, like if you say this is, this topic is taught in third grade, or, yeah. you know, so, so showing how it can fit into the curriculum. Uh, Absolutely, I, I would give curriculum standards, I would say here, here is if you're writing science, here is the, uh, here is this third grade, fourth grade, um, performance expectation for the next generation science standards. And as you can see, my book fits perfectly into it. Mm -hmm. Great, great. Okay, and if you wanna show them, uh, ha help them visualize what your book might look like, would you suggest a couple comp titles that have a Absolutely. layout that represents what you want? Okay. Yeah, I would say, you know, it, I'm, I'm envisioning something that has the format of this book but then mm -hmm. has the art style of this book mm -hmm. and ha I don't know, has this characteristic of this book. So just to sort of help them visualize it mm -hmm. um, in their minds, because that's, right. that's the single most important thing that I see in projects that have really good writing, but mm -hmm. they just seem not to get acquired. Right, yes, okay. Great. I'm just going to ask you a couple more questions here. You've given us so much of your time tonight, and it's just been <laughs> so wonderful. When you are, do you work with a lot of experts on the topic uh, when you're researching? Do you interview experts and that kind of thing? And do you have any tips for finding these people who would be willing to help writers do interviews, et cetera? Yes. So what I do is I will Google uh, you know how to use quote marks when you're googling university of mm -hmm. and then in a separate quote whatever my topic is and then you will just pull up cvs of whoever are the scientists that study that thing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so that's that's my number one way of finding them but I, although i i also i sometimes also find experts but you know i'll read a scientific paper and 
in the back, there will be references to other people who have written on that topic. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of use right. that chain as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you have experts vet your manuscript before you submit it to your editor? It often, so when I write a list book, an expository literature list book, they're often, so for example, I wrote a book called Feathers, Not Just for Flying. There's no world's leading expert in unusual ways that birds use their feathers. So I had one expert who was looking at this particular bird and a different expert that was looking at this particular bird. And so I, you know, I'm interviewing them and I, I, you know, I keep interacting with them throughout the process. Mm -hmm. um, so there really isn't any one person that vets the entire manuscript because by the time I'm done with the book, I'm the world's leading expert right. in that topic <laughs> because it's not, it is, it just isn't the way that a scientist would ever study the topic. Mm -hmm. Right. If you do use an expert either for research purposes or possibly to vet your manuscript, what is the protocol? Do you, ex are you expected to pay them for their time or how, how does this usually work? Well, I think if you're just, if you're interviewing them and you're asking them to like, um, you know, confirm something that they said, that that's part of their job. That's, you know, mm -hmm. scientists in order to advance in their career, they have to do, there has to be a, a community service mm -hmm. element to mm -hmm. what their job, they actually have to document that. So you're actually by working with you, they are, and helping to share their knowledge with a broader audience, they're actually doing something that's gonna help them to advance mm -hmm. in their career when it comes to their performance right. expectation. Mm -hmm. I think if you're expecting them to really vet a very long manuscript in some areas that may not be their specialty and they're gonna to have to spend hours and hours and hours of time, um, then, perhaps they do deserve payment, but that payment probably would come from your publisher. Right, right. Okay, okay, terrific. Okay, my last question for you, because we've had a few of these, um, are there any, where, where can people best find curriculum standards? Is there sort of a national curriculum site or do you go state by state to find this information? Yeah, so that's a good question. So the national science standards are called the next generation science standards. Mm -hmm. However, not all states have adopted them, mm -hmm. but book publishers look at those standards because they, you know, they can't create a book for each state. Right. Um, so they have to say, okay, well, if three quarters of the states are following this curriculum, then this is what we're going to hit. And chances are, even when uh, states don't follow NGSS, often what they're doing is similar at many grade levels mm -hmm. to NGSS. Um, so, and and there's, you know, it's the same with social studies. There are social studies standards, there are math standards, there are um, language arts standards. And you can just, if you just Google NGSS, you'll get the standards right there. Sure. So, and same with, you know, Common Core. Mm -hmm. And I was going to say also STEM, which someone asked, it, what is it? It's science, technology, engineering, math. Sometimes they throw art in there and make it STEAM. But again, are there sort of nationwide common standards for what that means in the classroom as well? No, because STEAM is, it's, I mean, STEM is a, is a catch-all. So okay. If you're if, if you're writing about math, you would look at the mm -hmm. math standards. If you're writing about science, sure. you would look at the science standards. Mm -hmm. um, there aren't engineering standards, although well, there are some engineering standards that are embedded in the next generation science standards. Mm -hmm. Okay, so basically, it's just a way of publishers saying if you can work science, technology, engineering, or math standards into your book, even if it's fiction, sometimes they are they're interested because again, it can be used in the classroom as additional text for whatever the bigger lesson is, right? True, I would say that of social studies too, though, mm -hmm. because they're, they're yeah. always looking. And in fact, it's more common to use social studies books in the classroom, especially at the middle grade, middle school or high school level um, than, you know, 
often science teachers um, will want to focus on hands-on teaching and will be a little bit reluctant to use science books in the classroom, but that is right. that is not the case for history. So mm -hmm. I would say that that's maybe even more important for history and social studies. Great, wow. Lots to think about here. Thank you, Melissa. This has been amazing. And we have a lot more questions, but we've taken up way too much of your time already. <laughs> so I so appreciate everything you've given us here tonight. And I everybody, Check out Melissa's books if you haven't, and definitely The Five Kinds of Nonfiction. Obviously, it will it's great for authors as, as well as educators. Thank you for everything you've done for kids nonfiction, Melissa. You're, you've helped move the entire category in a new direction, <laughs> and we Thanks. appreciate well, I, it. You know what? I would say the same about children's literature in general for you. You have just oh. for so many years Hmm. You have made an incredible contribution to the children's literature community, and I, I am grateful, and, and oh. many people should be so grateful. Well, thank you very much for saying that. Appreciate it. So, and thank you all for being here tonight, and we will see you on the first Tuesday. I don't even know what date it is. No, we're still in October. <laughs> Never mind. I'll see you. See you in two weeks. <laughs> I forgot what day it is. Okay, so you all have a good night. And Melissa, thank you again. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Bye.